Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. This is the competition climbing podcast, so lo-fi that Eurosport would give us a broadcast deal. Uh, joining us this week, uh, as is becoming tradition at the start of the comp season, is the all-seeing eye, the overlord of, of comp climbing, uh, and a bum leg. Nowadays, he just sits in his basement in New Zealand, steals other people's photos, as he's always been complaining about other people. And uh, it's, uh, it's, of course, Eddie Fauk. Uh, joining us from a climbing gym, a little bit of background noise, but it makes it authentic. Uh, and then, as always, co-host for this is uh, John Bergman, writing the recaps at climbing.com and the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. I don't even need to put the book on the screen anymore. I got it off by heart. Uh, make sure you pick it up at a bookstore near you. Uh, we're talking about Myringen. We're back. Uh, the World Cup season has restarted, uh, and so let's get right into things the way the show works everybody talks about what their headline for the event uh was and then who we think our big winners and big losers are to be polite guest is going to go first uh so let's hand this off to uh to the big the big head in the sky ed Falk. i guess we haven't sorry before we go ed, eddie's going to be shrinking and growing throughout this entire episode uh we're just having connection issues so uh deal with it you're only listening anyways just put on something else on the screen you'll be happy so eddie what is the headline from myringen well but see this is the hard one because as the guest you asked me to go first and that means that i get the headline headline which of course is that ifsc goes back to the future and puts a wall around europe <laughs> And, you know, a lot obviously happened over the weekend, but it's just stunning that we have seen the re-implementation of a pay-per-view service two weeks out from the season with very little broadcast from the governing body. And you saw that right through the event with people posting on IFSC's page repeatedly, where can I watch, where can I watch, where can I watch? And I think the reason the IFSC didn't publicize it much was they knew it was going to be highly unpopular. Now, that, you know, the whole thing, I'm almost speechless, I'm lost for words, and I had to do some notes about it to just bring my thoughts into line. And my first thought was the IFSC is the governing body in our sport. We hold in high esteem because they are the guardians. They are the um, the ones that are most invested in how we operate, how we progress as a sport. Um, but with that responsibility, there also has to be accountability. And when I see an action like this, which has huge implications on the athletes and the events, which is why in 2017 a very similar thing got knocked back then i go well for me to understand this the first thing i need to know and i think it needs to be transparent and i think the athletes and federations need to unite and ask for this is they need to see the risk assessments they need to see the due process that was completed in doing the deal they need to see what exit clause options we have as a sport to get out of the deal if it's not fit for purpose. Because from my understanding of what I've seen, they have sold broadcast rights to Discovery Plus. Now, that does not necessarily mean live broadcast. Nowhere in the press release does it say those events will be live. And when we've said, oh, well, what about viewing? They go, oh, well, it's live on the Eurosport Plus player. And it's like, well, it is this time, but what happens when it's in Korea? What happens when it's in the US? Um, They've taken that away. The other huge thing they've done is they've shrunk the audience. They've shrunk the audience because what is the viewing audience and the buying audience for Discovery Plus? Now, we don't know this yet. This is stuff we need from the IFSC. We need to know what their customer demographic is. If it's 50-year-old men, why did we do a deal with them? You know, we're trying to promote the sport, draw people in. We need to understand the demographic that this is being marketed to. Uh, because so much rides on this deal, sponsorships of athletes ride on this deal, sponsorships of events ride on this deal. And it's just, you know, I, I'm 
quite literally, when I first heard about it, I was dumbfounded. I didn't make a big post about it because a lot of people that complained when the IFSC released the news actually got banned and blocked by the IFSC on social media. And I had people reaching out to me saying, I put a comment up and the social media blocked me, um, the IFSC blocked me from all their accounts. Now, as the media, that's not really where I want to be. So I sit back and I observe and I try and make my statements based on acquired knowledge, experience and facts. So I wasn't really publicizing it. The IFSC were doing their best not to publicize it. Very few people were publicizing it. Then it hit and it was almost a storm. Do you know why it wasn't a storm? Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you give me your give me your theory. My theory is it wasn't a storm because the IFSC went, let's put photos backstage in ISO and distract all the athletes with something else to cry about to deflect the intensity that would have otherwise come straight in for the pay-per-view issue. I actually believe that that was a political move to do something to agitate the competitors and the coaches away from the big picture i think it was a distraction tactic okay i gotta I'm, I'm gonna jump in right now on this conspiracy theory thing because the rule book was published at the start of february with this rule in there right um there was a technical meeting the day before qualifications where if anybody had any questions or objections that was something that could have come up as far as i know it did not um so we're saying the athletes had you know, months to know about this. And it only came up during qualifications after the execution of this rule appears to have been botched. So if the athletes really want to make a big stink about the stream, I feel like this, this uh, trying to shut them up with some like bigger or with some, some more stuff to be distracted by comes too late. If, if the athletes wanted to make a big show about the, the stream, I don't think they were very organized about it. I don't know what they were waiting for. Like the last time around that this happened, they got like two days notice. In this case, they got two weeks. So if I think if the athletes really were going to make a big push to to make a change or try and hold them accountable in the way that they did in Myringen, which again was organized with, with literally like less than 48 hours, if I remember correctly, to do the red card ceremony. You got multiple people writing uh, op-eds in, in, uh, in different publications. There was none of that happening from the athletes this time. So I'm not willing to buy that that was a, that was a distraction tactic. But back to the to the broadcast uh, rights thing isn't there an argument to say well the ifsc's audience is a fairly uninvested audience in my opinion most of these people don't pay to watch a broadcast most of them have never paid to attend a competition almost none of them have ever paid to buy merchandise for an athlete or ifsc merchandise so what's the what's the risk in trying to actually get some cash for the eyeballs we think we can generate like actual revenue and maybe try and grow it Right. Like, is, is there not something to say, well, you know, the audience we have is is, you know, not actually doing much to support us aside from being a number to buy sponsors. Why can't we try and see if somebody else can do a better job than us? Well, and this is why I said I think we need to see the risk assessments and I think we need to see the due process. I think that needs to be available so we can make an educated argument for or against. Sure. Without that information, it's pure speculation. And we can look at trends in other sports and we can see that there's an invariable trend down in viewership. And we can look at that post by athletes, for instance, the excellent post by Manu, where he discussed quite clearly that it was going to interfere with their sponsorship because views are actually part of the bonus structure of most athlete sponsorships that the higher profile you have. So if you are making a bunch of fi finals and your sponsor is going, well, that's 100,000 people, well, that's 100,000 people. And then they look at your Instagram, then they look at your appearances in magazines, in local and international news, on social media. And that all goes towards your, um, your visibility bonus. Now, for instance, if you take YouTube, Last year for Myringen, there was somewhere in the area of, 100, of 120 to 130,000 people watched finals live on YouTube. This year it was just over 20,000. 
so that you know if, if as far as we know we like we don't know the numbers for the discovery stuff obviously absolutely we don't know the numbers for discovery stuff and also the numbers that we have are skewed because of course a lot of people in europe use nefarious means to still watch the broadcast live but that means they then appear as someone in another region mm -hmm. um and I'm not going to talk about what those means are because I actually don't think that's an appropriate topic for discussion. And I think the risk that gets run with people running around talking about how to get round paywalls is you end up screwing it for everyone. Um, now, coming back to it. I'm just imagining somebody at the IFSC saying, wait, what? What uh, v VPN? What is this? I, I'm I'm sure at this point they're aware of that uh, of that uh, uh, tool. Absolutely, uh, I'm sure they're aware of that tool, but I don't think it's appropriate for media to promote a way of cheating a governing body or any sporting body. I, you know, that's not a mature business decision on my part. I will sit there and I will argue the validity of them going to a pay TV system. And here's actually where I'm going to dig into it a little bit more. And sorry if this is going on a little bit. But I have no problem with pay-per-view. I actually subscribe to Formula One TV. Now, Formula One TV costs me less, than, less a year than Discovery Plus would. I get every practice session. I get every qualifying. I get every race. I get every Formula Two race. I get every Formula Three race. I get documentaries, I get everything live, plus I can watch historical content. So that's a value add. Even though I can see the Formula One free on TV, I will pay so I can see more. Now to me, the correct decision for the IFSC would have been to have actually gone with a YouTube membership model and said, semis and finals are free. But if you become a YouTube member of our channel, you're also going to get the broadcast of qualifiers, and it doesn't have to be a flash broadcast, it just has to be a fixed um, thing, and you're going to get early access to interviews and things like that. And they probably would have had quite an uptake from the climbing community, because the climbing community would have understood that there was added value and that there was benefit to them, and it was going back into the sport. Now with Discovery Plus, I actually pulled up a French... Um, media site because there were some comments under it and you've got to remember what discovery plus is offering is exactly the same as what the rest of the world is getting for free except now it's seven pound a month for however much it is i don't know or a week or whatever i literally don't know don't care um so this is the comment men's final was broadcast at 11.05 p.m so that's for an event that took part at 4 p.m it then started at 11.30 p.m. because the broadcast before was running late. So if you were a fan, you were, you were at 11.30 p.m. on a Sunday night before you even get a, got to start to see it. Um, they then said, where is it here? Um, for men's finals, we got to see Paul Jemp and Yoshiyuki Agata. And then there were ads. And when the ads came back, it was Tamao Narasaki and Kakura Fuji. <laughs> then they went to block two and there was ads and they didn't see the first free climbers at all. And then they saw the last free climbers. And this went on through the event for people watching. Now, if I'm paying for something, I don't want ads. I don't want, you know, I want the, mm -hmm. the best option, not the worst. Sure. If I'm paying for something, I want Matt Groom commentating because he's knowledgeable and he's there. I don't want someone sitting in the UK who, from the sounds of it, was terrible. Uh, I don't want someone sitting in Germany who, from the sounds of it, was terrible. And some Germans messaged me and said this to me. And I said, yes, but wasn't it easier having the commentary in your own language? And they said... It was a bit easier being able to understand the language, but it was worse because he didn't understand the sport. Sure. Uh, so this to me just feels half-assed, you know, late, poorly implemented, and not becoming of a governing body that protects its interests 
and protects the interests of its stakeholders. So I've been reading a book lately, and I don't know if either of you gentlemen have seen this book, and it's going to be huge when I hold it up because I'm big in camera, but have either of you read Climb Epic by no. Mark Lemonestrel? No. So, so Mark Lemonestrel was head of the Ethics Committee, or Ethics Commission, sorry, at the IFSC, and he wrote a book in 2020 about our ethics as a sport, the IFSC's ethics as a body, everything like this. I read his and, report that he published, uh, like on the IFSC website, I guess, which actually may have been published by the IFSC themselves rather than him separately. But uh, but he, I guess, he was the one that was working on that. Um, I can't remember what the name of it was. It had a, a very, you know, sport federation yeah. title. But anyway, go ahead. And so I would say in a situation like this, where we feel that the IFSC has acted counter to our values as a community, and that is the broad feeling that we get from social media and from published information we've received so far, that people should write to the Ethics Commission and raise it as a problem with the ethics of the IFSC, because that's what the IFSC Ethics Commission exists for. Now, do you know the problem with that? Yep. Uh, the Which, Ethics Commission does not exist. Right. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Uh, Mark Lamenestrel and uh, the other member of the Ethics Commission, uh, a woman, I think, from Japan, uh, were, uh, let's just say they were dismissed. They are no longer there. Um, they, there they may were or may not be because new their members. Findings, their findings apparently interfered with the governance of the, governance of the IFSC so in the IFSC's press release, um, as a result, the current Ethics Commission and its members will be suspended. There will be a complete reform of the commission, including its regulations and composition, and a new commission will be appointed as soon as circumstances allow. And if you have an Ethics Commission and you fire them because they don't agree with your governance, that that to me is like, well, surely the, your governance, if it's raising red flags of your ethics commission, you shouldn't be firing them. You should be taking a look in the mirror. So, um, you know, this whole thing with the introduction of the paywall for what so far after one event has proved to be a lower quality product than what was being offered for free, it just rubs me the wrong way. I think it's a very poor choice for our sport. And I think that, as I said earlier, um, you know, the IFSC are the guardians of our sport as appointed by us. Well, as appointed by the federations that we represent, so to speak, blah, blah, blah. Now, that position, these are paid professionals. They're not mum and dad sitting on the couch. These people do this for a living. And so they need to take responsibility for actions and there needs to be accountability. So as I said, as, a, as stakeholders of the sport, which the athletes, the federations, the coaches, and the media are, we need to see the risk assessment. We need to see the due process that was carried out to understand the benefit. And if the benefit is not there, if those risk assessments weren't carried out, if due process weren't, wasn't completed, then I think we are within our rights as a community to be asked for the resignation of the president and the board uh, under no, under a no confidence clause. And the postscript to that is uh, is Marco Scaleris elected for another four years to twenty twenty five. Uh, so uh, contact your local uh, federation rep, I guess, if you uh, if you want to see Eddie's uh, uh, action take place there. Well, it's not my action, because as I said, if they've, if they've carried out correct process, that's fine. Sure. But as a governing body, if they haven't done their job, then we have to question why they're governing. And we have to look at their value in the sport at that point. John, you're being awfully quiet and mature sitting in your dark Dracula-like yeah. corner. Yes. <laughs> Mary, coming out of the darkness. No, I, you know, I, it's, I'm just, I'm just kind of listening to be honest because I, there's a lot of this that I don't feel like I know enough about. It, for instance, I don't really know the, I don't know if anybody does in in the public about the details of what 
fully happened with the e- with the ethics committee. Um, I don't know the details, uh, the full details of the the deal with Discovery Plus. I don't even know the the details as an American. I don't really even know the details of how popular things like Discovery Plus and Eurosport, how prevalent these are. That's my in, big thing is I'm having such European a hard time market. judging this because I've, I've heard some good things too from, from one or two people on Twitter who said, you know, it, it was kind of crap, but they're talking about doing this or doing that. And so, you know, it's, I, I've not seen any of it. So it's hard for me to judge the quality, but uh, I can imagine it being worse just because you probably have new people broadcasting it. Um, but anyway, yeah, sorry, John, to cut you off there. No, I and and so I, I feel like in some sense for me to to kind of try to collect my thoughts about this, I'd be speaking a little out of school. Uh, I, I will say, I I do not at all think it's bad that the IFSC is seeking new means and and lucrative means, presumably for for broadcasting these competitions. And I say that solely because I watch a lot of sports that's pretty much all the only thing i watch are sports and the ifsc is the only these world cups are the only thing i watch the only sport i watch that is free on youtube everything else is behind some sort of pay system either it's a like you said eddie either it's like its own network subscription thing or either it's a, a sports network like espn espn plus here in the states where you can live stream it or it's a, a traditional tv channel or a cable channel or something like that so i do think it's it's it'd be a little unrealistic if we would sit here and, and think that this would be the model that that we would have forever for these for these world cups um now implementation that's that's another matter I do kind of question some of the the pushback I saw to this. Eddie, you spoke to some of this. Some of the arguments against it, I find a little flimsy or a little porous. I'm not that's not to say I don't sympathize with the athletes and with the coaches because I do. But when they when the argument is something like this will impact athlete visibility, which will which will have which will be problematic for their sponsors. I hear that and I think, okay, that's a that's a valid thing, but but that seems more like an issue for that athlete and that sponsor to discuss rather than an, an issue for the IFSC, right? If that seems like something then the athlete should circle up with their sponsor and and try to redo their deal or if not try to pursue a new sponsor that is it just that, I don't understand how it okay, it affects visibility with my sponsor. Okay, well then like that's that's a legit problem, but like that's something between the athlete and the sponsor. And I, I see the IFSC as kind of this outlier that it doesn't really, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm making that point clear, but that's just kind of how I see that argument a little porous. And again, I'm not to say I don't sympathize with them. I do, but that's my take on it. And this is, so I'm going to come in here with some experience of 2017, which is the last time this happened. Because at that stage, I was still working with the IFSC, but I was also contracted to several companies taking photos. And I got contacted very quickly by sponsorship managers. And we're talking major climbing companies, companies or climbing and outside of climbing companies, companies that are big. And the consistent thread with them was that if it went behind a paywall, they would reevaluate their sponsorship of competition athletes. And if they felt they were going to get a higher presence out of outdoor athletes, they would transfer their funds into climbers outside because they had unrestricted access to their visibility, whereas a paywall takes that right away from the climber. Um, Now, also with event organisers, I know... Hasseltown Mountain Festival in 2017, when they had sold all the sponsorship to fund the event, they had sold it on X number of views coming into the region globally through YouTube. And when that off, when that then was going to go to Flow Sport, they were furious because if they went from 200,000 views to 20,000 views, they were basically breaching all their contracts with the uh, Um, the people that they had signed on. And this is my big concern, and this is what it comes back to risk assessment and due diligence. We need to know how long has this been in the works? 
We need to know what athletes, sponsors, federations were contacted, were briefed on this and had input and said, actually, in the world of climbing sponsorship, this is how it works and this is going to be the impact. And then they talk to Discovery Plus and Discovery Plus are like, well, our findings are that after a year of being on Discovery Plus, we attract these new sponsors. And they go, well, is this a fair compromise? And the athletes go, okay, yes or no. But that's all dialogue and that's all risk assessment, due process. I, I know I keep saying those words, but from a project management perspective, that's what you look for. And I'm worried that it's a day late, a dollar short. If they had said, we're going behind the paywall, and then the Discovery Plus Eurosport comment had been, com, content, sorry, had been superb and had been above the level of what people were getting on YouTube, then there'd probably be very little complaint because people would see a value. The fact that you've said, give us money, we're going to give you lower value, you're not going to see climbers because of ads, the media is going to have to publish information late or people are going to be upset for spoilers, this, that and the other, just to me reeks of an immature business decision that hasn't been completed. If they hit the ground running, if they said, come to Eurosport, we're going to have extra, as I said, with the YouTube potential for a membership thing, we're giving you this, this and this. People go, okay, great, they're making an effort. We haven't seen that. All we've heard is Marco Scalaris say, hopefully this will lead to more sponsorships in the future, um, which is a very wishy-washy, ambiguous statement. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested to see how it progresses over, over the year. I, I'll be honest, I'm, I am generally pretty... I, I expect change to happen slowly at this point, and I think if there was money coming in from this deal, maybe there's a chance that we'll see an improvement over time. Uh, especially if the broadcast on Eurosport is being put yeah. together by the IFSC broadcast team. Maybe we'll see another microphone show up in the next comp, which seems to be the pace of things happening as you just get a new microphone every once in a while, which is awesome. I, I love it. But that might be the speed that we have to expect this stuff to come along. Who knows? And we will see. Um, it is a very disappointing start for sure. Um, but I mean, let's, uh, um, let's see if over the next couple comps, if the, if, if the improvements come, then, then, uh, and it might be something to reevaluate. Well, one thing, and sorry, I know that I'm going over my time here and harping on, <laughs> um, I've actually had people contact me within the sport going, so is this the time to run another competition series? For instance, we already have events like Quiff, Studio Block, Dock Masters, um, Block Shop Open, North Face Cup, around the world. Now, if someone was to say, we want a point structure for those that works globally, would you guys be on board? It means that you're going to get more international athletes attending. Now, our expectations are that we have a 50-50 split in gender of splitters, uh, sorry, of, in gender of setters, judges, officials, so that we're showing that we're embracing diversity and we're progressing the sport. We make sure that we are diverse in where we place the comps so that we are reaching different groups of people. And we fix all these things that people commonly complain about what's happening. Because, of course, what happens next year is going to have a huge influence on the number of people doing IFSC World Cups. And there might be a lot of pros floating around with nothing to do. So this wouldn't, this wouldn't scupper the IFSC. That would never be the purpose in my understanding because the IFSC is your Olympic pathway. But next year, if they go to two athletes per country qualifying for World Cups and then any that are previously seeded in the top 40, you might see countries like Japan or USA, uh, UK, France, wherever, with a lot of world-class level athletes that can't get into the World Cups that want to show their stuff. So have the IFSC open the back door for someone to come in with a little bit of money, a little bit of ambition and set up, you know, um, Pro Boulder ranking, so PBR, and then we get it sponsored by the beer brand. Like, you know. <laughs> I love it. Good, good idea. 
But yeah, there will be room for, I, I guess, what you would kind of expect would be a tier two scene or at the moment a continental scene, but there's there's other ways to, to do it. And competition's always good. We got to move on, though. That's 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 uh, This is an hour-long podcast, guys. Don't you remember? <laughs> So we just blew well, was there a comp- well, Was there a comp <laughs> in the weekend? I, I can't remember. <laughs> I just, there was a lot of Twitter. That was all. John, headline from the event. Go. Yeah. yeah, well, it's funny because my headline also only has to do with the event tangentially. Yeah, <laughs> but i got to change my, mine and get us back to climbing. Holy shit. My headline <laughs> is the women's division gets its biggest shakeup in recent memory. And of course, what I'm referring to is Yanya Garnbrandt wins, and perhaps we could talk about her actual performance in that win. We can talk about that in a second, but this is right after the performance. She does an interview, post-event interview, and she says that she's going to step away from competition, or at least elite world-class level competition, for the remainder of the Bouldering World Cup season. And first and foremost, I think we can all agree good for her i mean if there's anybody that's earned a little bit of a a, a, you know to do whatever the heck she wants that's yanya especially i wrote in my piece for climbing athletes mental health has been such a talking point in recent the the past couple years in all sorts of sports and yanya kind of hinted to that in her interview she didn't say a whole lot but she said something like the mental and physical preparation for the olympics was still kind of you know, she was still needing some recovery for that. So, so good for her. I'm, I'm glad I commend her for, for acknowledging and recognizing that maybe some time off would be good. Um, but in the, in that she will now be gone from the rest of the bouldering world cup circuit. I mean, how long has she been dominant on this? It's been what, five years, give her, you know, something like that. Maybe, maybe longer. Uh, and 2017 till now. Yeah, and and I think when we were all sitting here predicting what this season would be like, I think we kind of all predicted it would be similar to those previous seasons with Yanya being so dominant. And this World this World Cups in Marion certainly seemed to indicate that it would be. And now all of a sudden, the whole rest of the season became a lot more unpredictable with Yanya's absence, uh, in pen, impending absence. And... I'll close by saying this. If I am Natalia Grossman or I am Brooke Rabatou or I am who, who Stasha Geho or Orion Berton or any of these other women that are that kind of seem to be these perennial finalists at this point, I'm pretty happy right now. Not that I would not that they would ever like, you know, want Yanya necessarily to not be there. They're competitors. I'm sure they'd love to compete against her, but they're essentially being gifted this of, hey, Yanya's not going to be there for the rest of the season, that takes away what is the biggest X factor in any bouldering event, which is you have to beat Yanya pretty much to to win. And that's gone now. So I think the future looks particularly bright for those other women, Natalia, Brooke, Stasha, Orion, Futaba, any of them, to uh, really have a pretty phenomenal season as a result of this. I, I actually, oh, sorry, you go. I, wow. Yeah, yeah. Eddie's Eddie's had enough of the mic. He's he's uh, on a timeout for a second. After all that, <laughs> I was gonna say I'm so torn as a fan because you know the the first part of me was like it, John. I, I messaged you uh, before this competition was I could wait another season to start these World Cups. Like just the two years of Olympic nonsense, uh, or some people may feel it was longer than that. It it's left like everybody's just exhausted, and you need a break as much as we've had, you know, a bunch of months. Like I could have waited a little bit longer; it would be okay. It was really intense, and I didn't have to do any climbing in this damn thing, right? Like I didn't have to train to come back this season. So I a hundred percent get it that a bunch of these athletes would say, you know, I I'm gonna chill out and enjoy my life after an incredibly stressful up and down. Mm-hmm craziest couple years of their existence that's totally reasonable but from the climbing side i i can't it's so unsatisfying to know that the best climber is out there and they're just not at the comps that for me personally is so frustrating to deal with and and it it's just it's it leaves such a uh, such a, a frustrating question and uncertainty about the results that are coming out, right? It's one of those things where people are going to look at the podiums in the past, and if they don't have that context, it's going to make no fucking sense. Um, it's it's uh, it's brutal. And all I all I'm going to say is, 
and I'm knocking on wood as I say this, so it's not my fault if anything happens. But Yanni, if you're outside, make sure you have a good belayer because I don't want you to get live Sansos. You turn 23, you get dropped, and you never come back to World Cups. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let this be the end. Please come back for lead season. Good uh, historic wow, you, reference you, there. That's you made that dark. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was, so, I, 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 was I, I was not expecting that, but that's a really good. I mean, good, it freaks good, the shit out of me because this is the not, time. You know, this was horrible, this but... is like this time in the calendar. This is the end of the Liz Sansos era. She she turns this old and it's over. She gets dropped, and it's just done. And I was so frightened going into this season. I was like, man, Yanya, you better be careful. Don't like, don't do it. Yeah. So I'm actually going to add to what John said because uh, John's headline was on point, but he only focused on Yanya. The other thing we got to remember is Akio has now retired. Shauna has now retired. Petra is out for an indefinite time injured. Um, and that shakes the field up. So the one, not, not so much the our, Petra our one, but the other, yeah, the other ones. Okay. Well, she, she's still a consistent semi <laughs> sure. finalist. Okay. I yeah. mean, if she, I mean, if she sure. offered to be, if she offered to be Canadian, you guys would take her as soon as you could. That, as you could. That's, that's an even lower bar than consistent semi finalist. Come on now. Don't, don't do that to me. But, um, but yeah, so anyway, what I was saying is, it's it's a changing of the guard and Yanya is so young she's just turned 23 but she was a final regular from when she was 17 mm -hmm. so with her taking the season off so many of the established stars gone it, it's a complete shake-up it's huge and it's fantastic for the sport because it gives these athletes that have been bubbling under you know people like Andrea people like um, Futaba, people like Stasia, who have been fring fringe elite, if that makes sense and isn't insulting. Yep. They've, they're the on-the-cusp climbers, and now they get their opportunity to stand up. And then you have the young climbers like Oriane, uh, Ayala Karem, people like that coming through, Madison Fisher, whoever it may be. Really, yeah. Let me ask you both this. It's it's fantastic for those competitors. It's fantastic for the sport in, in the sense of growing some new stars. But is it a detriment to the sport when, when all is said and done and you're looking back at it historically? In other words, is this going to be a season that Tyler kind of hinted at where you're going to have these kind of unofficial asterisks by whoever gets the gold medal on in the next several world cups because the, the, it's going to indicate, yeah. Okay. But Yanya was not there. Is, I, are we going to look at this season that way five years from now, 10 years from now? What do you guys 100%, think? 100, like, yes. I, I, yeah, a hundred percent. As much as we all say, you can only compete against who's in front of you. A hundred percent. It's so, it is the most dominantly dominant person we've had in the scene for a long time. It's, it's impossible not to, to think that way. Yeah. And I mean, like, I just at his point really quickly, just to point out, excluding Petra, she is injured. I don't, you know, whatever happens next, but just keeping in mind the last time she won a gold medal was in 2015. There's only two... Uh, she did win the world champs in 2016. Oh, pardon me. And yeah, she, is, sorry. And she I, is the current ice climbing world champion. Sorry, the, the current what? Ice climbing world champion. She won that a couple of months Entirely ago. Entirely valid point. <laughs> they, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, and she's an Olympian. <laughs> yes, uh, but but what I what I mean to say is there's only two women, if Petra is injured, that are competing in the circuit right now that have ever won a bouldering gold medal, right? And it's Natalia Grossman who showed up last season, and it is Miho, and Miho is. Well, we'll see. I don't want to jinx her based off one result, but I mean the Olympic year was rough on her, so you know, hopefully hopefully things work out but yeah it's a like it's it's a very fresh scene man it's uh it's going to be wild to see what happens it's very rare that you get new gold medalists in women's bouldering um so it'll make it exciting but i do believe there's a big asterisk beside everything that happens this season more so yeah. more so than in the olympic season frankly because i think you had athletes coming in and out and and it was just kind of a given but this is this is a big one this is harder to deal with and, and don't you have oh. yeah. Uh, I was going to say, and don't you kind of secretly wonder what is – Yanya's statement was very vague, of course. It was very brief. It was a post-event interview. And with all respect to her privacy, I can't help but wonder, like, what it actually – kind of what is at the root of all this? Because something tells me 
she's not just going to sit at home and rest. She's posted in, on Instagram that she's projecting La Dura Dura and stuff. So I, I have a feeling we, we are still going to see her. It's like she, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she still kind of makes headlines and stuff like that. Um, she's, I, I, I have a feeling she's got some, some plans and some projects and some other stuff that she maybe wants to do and just couldn't do it during the World Cup grind or something like that. Um, well, well the thing is, if you're training for La Jura Jura, you're not training for Boulder World Cups. Yeah, you can, you, really, you can, you can really tell she's out of shape lead. based on this car, babe. Yeah. But, well, the uh, other thing, of course, is she apparently has been trying, uh, is it Burgerstein sit? Um, so, you know, with V15 Boulder, because um, she did the stand that was recently, you saw the video on that. Um, so she's, you know, she's doing something different. She's having a break good and a break to a perfectionist isn't stopping. It's just doing something different. I, I was going to say, that's the one thing I said, and this is the question I'll never get to probably get a straight answer from her for, but you would have to ask, like, do you really have the motivation after winning an Olympic medal and after sweeping a boulder season? Is this really your main motivation right now to prove that you can win another World Cup? Like, really? Like, at this point, you got to be looking at those big climbs like La Dura Dura and whatever else is out there, because I'm the last person to ask about hard, actual rock climbs. But at some point, you got to say, I, I'm going for, like, all-out greatness, and what's the frontier that I haven't had a chance to really conquer yet? It's time to crack those huge climbs outside. Um, I think it's going to be a, a blockbuster year for her. She's going to shred outdoors. Um, and I will miss most of the headlines because I just don't pay attention to half of that stuff. But she's going to crush it. And it's it's probably going to be an incredibly healthy break for her um, and only cement her. Uh, it, I, I found it really funny that she did that interview with Chris Caloose, uh, you know, kind of before a, a huge year. Excellent interview, by the way. I'm so jealous that a guy who barely pays attention to indoor rock climbing managed to get such a good interview out of her. That was that was great. Um but uh, it's funny that he did that interview before she really spends a, a huge year outside or season outside. But um, yeah, anyway, good. Uh, check it out if you haven't seen that interview yet. Yeah. Uh, let, let me move on to, to my headline, which I actually forget because I was super <laughs> unprepared today. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So my, my headline for, for this whole thing was that the athletes made a buttload of noise this weekend. And in my opinion, it none of it made sense. It was all noise, and they have not figured their shit out. Two particular topics was one the paywall, uh, and the other being the uh, photos in ISO. Um, for, well, I, I guess we'll just start with the the paywall on the broadcast. Listen, last time this happened, you guys had two days, and I think I already talked about this when Eddie had his diatribe. But last time around, you guys had two days, and you got your shit together, and you crushed that shit. In, in 48 hours, you you presented a, a great show of force that was easy to visualize. It looked like everybody was on board and the deal got crushed and, and finished. It never happened for that event and it was over after that. Now we're talking about different players. Flow Sport, they broadcast like college track and field on the internet. So probably not as, as big a player as a Eurosport kind of thing. I'm not going to necessarily say the deals are comparable. Um, but this was announced two weeks ahead of time instead of two days. And there was no coherent messaging from the athletes. If you guys are going to say that this is, is a critical part of your livelihood, why hasn't anything come out of you guys this time around uh, when you managed to do it so effectively last time? And I am serious about that. Like you guys do hold all the power as much as the broadcasting means so much to you guys. You guys are able to take actions that gets people's attention. You can go out on the wall for problem number one and then not climb. You guys can not show up. You guys can boycott an event. These are things that you can actually do, right? As much as yes, there's some detriment to you if you don't show up for a comp. You guys have a ton of power in this. And why is it down to like a couple of French climbers and coaches on Instagram during the event when you've had two weeks, is that really all that's actually happening? Um, this is something where you guys had the chance to to make the noise about it this weekend and you didn't use the opportunity. And that makes it sound like you're not organized or not all on the same page about this deal. So there's something going on with the athletes that they have to sort their shit out if it does matter that much to all of them. And the second issue was on the photos in isolation. Um, that little message going around on Instagram Again, the rule was published and announced on February 9th, so everybody should have been aware that there was the possibility of photos or diagrams in isolation. That shouldn't have come as a surprise to anybody, 
as much as the athletes were saying, oh, we didn't know it was going to happen or we got no feedback, that message itself made clear that the Athletes Commission did have a chance to give feedback. And apparently from at least some of the Athletes Commission, the feedback was negative, whatever. It's not necessary that the, you know, the technical committee or whatever listens to the athletes every time. They probably shouldn't every time. But you guys knew about it. I'm okay with y'all making noise during the event when they botch the implementation of it. That's fine because it does sound like the photos were posted inconsistently in different places. Some athletes got to see it earlier, some later, some coaches got to see these things and some didn't. I think that's 100% reasonable to complain about because a rule was implemented un inconsistently and unfairly. That's completely reasonable. But the rest of it was... It just like a knee-jerk reaction to, to something you didn't like. And, and that's, I think you diluted your message way too much there. It's the, like, if you guys don't like the change, your messaging was mad and consistent. I love some of these, uh, some of the benefits that come with posting photos in ISO. I love the idea that if you're new to the wall, you get to see where your boulder is going to be ahead of time. I love that it gives you a little sense of what kind of style you might be coming out to on your first boulder. So you can kind of maybe tweak your warm up. Stuff like that to me is completely reasonable. And I also like the idea that we're kind of, chipping away at, in my opinion, the unnecessary isolation and, and lock and key hold we have over photos of the, of the boulders. Um, I know that was an issue that came up at the Olympics when video of some of the, uh, uh, climbs on the Olympic wall got released before the actual event. And so hypothetically, some athletes may have been able to see that video ahead of time. And something like this can act as a, a buffer to that, where you say, you know what, let's say a local news station accidentally broadcasts some video of a problem ahead of time because they didn't understand the isolation rules. Now every athlete gets a chance to just see that image before they go out. I think it is a bit of an equalizer and I'm totally okay with that. Um, so I think the messaging was just a little bit silly and underthought and, and not quite organized, which is unfortunate given that I think the paywall issue is a bigger one and nothing came of that. And that's a little bit embarrassing. I don't buy the conspiracy theory angle that the IFSC implemented this rule or, or chose to post the photos just to distract everyone. But I think it showed that there is a, a lack of organization in the athletes around what they supposedly say are the most important issues to their careers. Um, so that's my headline from this event. It was, I, I guess the, the takeaway from, from my and Eddie's point is there was a lot of noise around this event. It was really unfortunate that, you know, the climbing was good. Um, but there was a lot else going on. Yeah, the, the noise actually overshadowed the event, and you can see that by our headlines not being about the event. Yeah. And that's actually really disappointing. So, yeah. But such is life. And, you know, I, I happen to have a different opinion to you on the photos thing, but I just don't think it's worth sure. going into because the athletes will manage that. Yeah, hopefully. That, that's now out there. The athletes and coaches can sort that out. That's, you know, that's their job. As you said. Yeah, no, 100%. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's start crushing through this stuff. Let's go to the good, because I think we might actually talk about some climbing at this point, possibly. Um, I, I, though I'm not sure. Uh, Eddie, okay, we're... I'll, I'll <laughs> think about something different. Give me a... No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, look, the good for me is actually very similar to, um, to John's headline, because it was around the changing of the guard, the diversity of athletes, coming through into semis and into finals. I thought that was great. Uh, single biggest highlight, uh, Andrea Kuman. you know, she's a great climber that's always sort of bubbled under and escaped attention. But she was so good recently. And now she's like, yeah, sorry, give me. That's no, all good. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to worry about it. Okay. All right, uh, kids. Do you mind maybe not doing that right can now? Can we can we talk about how much how much how much sway Eddie has that Eddie, he can sit Eddie. down in a bouldering gym and start telling the employees not to do their job because he's on a phone call? That's hell yeah. All right. Sorry, but you know. Um. Anyway, so yeah, getting back to where I was. Sorry for the yeah, distraction no there. Uh, you know, so incredibly pleased for Andrea. Um, you know, she made finals in World Champs last year. 
made finals again tonight, I actually felt it was really disrespectful of Matt Groom saying, oh, what a big shock that she was in finals. I was like, dude, that's not how you, you know, if someone makes finals, that's not a respectful way to talk about an athlete. Um, because I think everyone in those finals deserved to be there on merit. And yeah, things can be surprising or shocking, but you have to be quite cognizant as a commentator how you present that thought because you don't want to be like, well, we never expected to see them in a final. You know, that's not respectful. Yeah, of sure, that. yeah. I can, I can get halfway with you, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you might say, you know, oh, it's really great to see Andrea making her first World Cup final in a home World Cup. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of, that's cool. And that says what needs to be said. You don't go, oh, I'm shocked or I'm surprised or whatever. Um, because if you saw her climbing in semis, why would you be surprised? You look great. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but yeah, so my positive is the diversity in people making um, making semis and making finals. Um, you know, people like Paul Yent, uh, Yemp, uh, that guy from France, yeah, um, Colin Duffy, um, you know, Ayala Karam, Karim, I'm losing it here, Ayala Karim topping her group and qualifying uh you know there's a lot of new faces and it was it was pretty cool can i can i ask about the ayala karem thing because she she topped her group in qualifiers and the instant talking point was well she's kept her form from quiff which i think winning quiff is is kind of a that's a it's a big comp there's a lot of people there but the only truly notable comp climber there is Evgenia Kazbakova. So that's, that's kind of who you beat in my, and this, this is a level up for Ayala. Like that's a, that's a, it's a big improvement on her results. I think she had an excellent qualifier, but I feel like the storyline was a little bit like it gave it as if, as if this was expected or, or at the, as Quiff is like a reasonable predictor for how they're going to do in, in a, a world cup where you've actually got the whole field. I thought that was like a little bit overcooked and obviously semifinals, you know, just goes to yeah. show that you can't get away. If you, you know, you got to win more than one round. Um, well, so for me, I think Quiff this year wasn't what it has been in the past. No. Um, I don't think anyone would deny that. But Ayala has had great results in juniors. Everyone's seen her coming up, especially the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't unexpected that she made semis, but to qualify in first was fantastic. Oh, yeah. It's also, it's also not unexpected that she bottled it in semis because mm-hmm. first time on that level, <laughs> all the pressure in the world, everyone's saying, well, we expected you to be here. Mm-hmm. It's probably actually worse than flying under the radar. Yeah. Event. You know, yeah. I think um, some of the other climbers that come into semis and they almost like come into semis like under a little blanket, like sneak in the back of the viewing queue or something. Yeah. And they play a blinder. But I think if everyone's talking about you before semis, if you're not an experienced competitor, that's probably quite a lot of pressure. And I, I get the feeling a Yala felt that. For sure. That's that's a, a <laughs> making semifinals in that position is awful i like i mean you you i think you have to be a top level competitor to handle semifinals after everybody has already climbed and you've already seen the scores yeah. posted from people who are are frankly in you know have a, a much higher you know previous form than you do that's that's a rough way to make semifinals like incredible climbing and qualifiers obviously but yeah um uh yeah well we, we don't know we hope so yeah <laughs> true we'll just go by the numbers and hope we'll go stats, by the numbers stats tell you everything guys you don't have to you don't have to look at the climbing at all stats stats never lie um, another yeah. another person we should mention in that group eddie that that you're talking about was orion i, I mean because we had talked about her when we were doing with natalie barry we were doing the year-end awards and stuff we had pointed out that she that orion had a I mean, she had a great season last year, but she did kind of fall off after the first, I don't remember how many it was, but there was definitely a dip as the season progressed. And so we were kind of wondering, I, th- I think it, like heading into this season, we had no idea where she was going to, where she was going to be. It was it going to be a continuation of kind of the, 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 uh, the, the, the lower the level of that climb. dip. Yeah. yeah the, yeah. the, the ebb or the flow. And um, she st- obviously just, I mean, it was a great off season for her. She looked fantastic in her performance um, 
and you know ended up um, getting fourth. So uh, great start for her. Really exciting, and and that is going to be a competitor that it's going to be particularly fun to to watch her again this season and to see how she does from comp to comp and you know compare it to last season and whatnot. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see these guys in the asterisk season to see how well they can do because I think it will be a pretty cool opportunity for a lot of them to step up and she's you know Ariane Batone has the opportunity to be the first female bouldering world cup winner since dinosaurs worked, walked the earth you know it's, it's been a minute so um and of course that no disrespect to Fanny because she's still there she could still pull it out but um you know it's been a minute and I think the French would love to see Ariane reach her potential because she again she showed so much as a junior just unbelievable and she started so strong last year, but yeah, I think it got a bit much. She probably got tired. She probably still had school and things like that and tapered. I, so. I just want to say the one thing I noticed was, you know, the talking points from when we first saw her last season was she had all of this youthful excitement and it can't comes through in her face and it comes through in her behavior and it's awesome, but it also came through in how she climbed on the wall. And, and my original impression last year was you, you climb like you're at a youth world championship kind of and i saw so much less of that she her climbing looks so much more mature but she retained all of the excitement coming through in her face and her emotions which was like exactly the combo i want she looked like she was at uh, climbing at an adult world cup but still just like such a compelling person to actually have on the screen that was i uh, i was really happy about that and i hope this year is more consistent with her because i would love to see her you know in every final she's such a great addition just like mejdi like you know give me give me more of that it's uh, it's excellent yeah yeah uh john uh Sorry, go ahead, Eddie, if you want to. Uh, no, I was just say I'm done. Okay, perfect. Well, re- this dovetails really nicely with what Eddie was just saying, his list of the winners, because I think Colin Duffy deserves to be um, in the spotlight. And I have an article coming out about this be- because there's been this phenomenon after the event where I look at my social media, maybe it has to do with my Instagram algorithm and stuff, but... <laughs> Colin Duffy, he finished in fifth place, but looking at all the reaction and the social media posts, you would think that he won this, the comp, or at least that he got a medal or something like that. I've just seen so many posts with people hyping him up, people stoked about him, people, you know, um, just stoked about how he battled through the, that crazy third boulder. And, and it just, I think this was really a star making performance for him, which is kind of strange to say, because you're talking about a guy who's a American national champion. He's an Olympian. He's a decorated on the youth scene and stuff. But, but I was thinking about it like this. I I really think, I mean, I think we can all agree that Colin Duffy has the potential to become one of the greatest comp climbers of all time. I mean, he's the potential, right? Like he's, I mean, he's a, He's an incredible talent. And and if you looked at his final round, he he had so many almosts, right? And he he came so close to topping every single boulder. He touched the top hold of every single boulder, if not you know, almost secured a top of every single boulder. It was it's just kind of there the was several times. Yeah. yeah, and there was just some whatever you want to call it, bad luck. Obviously, the, the judging issues on the third boulder. If he he zigged instead of zagged, whatever. I think with just a little bit of tweaking, just a little bit of the universe kind of smiling on him a little bit, he would have topped every boulder in that round. And if he comes away from that round having topped every boulder, he looks head and shoulders above the rest of that men's field that is full of Tomoa, Yoshiyuki, I I mean, you know, Kokoro, established crushers. And Mm -hmm. Duffy was almost head and shoulders ahead of them, almost topping everything. And again, I know you don't want to play the game of almosts, but I just came away from that round thinking, man, this was, you know, Duffy was, he almost cruise through all four of these boulders and for that reason i really think if his career progresses and he does indeed become one of the all-time greats on the comp scene i think this finals could be seen as somewhat of a of a waypoint somewhat of a little bit of a prophecy of we we got the glimpse of that future greatness true greatness all-time greatness here at Meringen. 
that's it. Yeah, I think a lot of the excitement around Colin then was you can see that he's coming. There is no denying it. It's, you know, there was obviously the narrative around him being the victim of judging decisions, which for the spectator is engaging because you're watching this guy having to go out and, you know, anyone else that made a false start was pulled off at the start. Colin made a false start and they pulled him off after he topped it. It's like, come on, that's, you know, so th there's the empathetic narrative. And then there's the, as you said, he was so close to topping all four. And the whole climbing community, you know, when he was 13, 14, he was this kid with enormous potential. But what we all love to see that enormous potential realized. And I think, yeah, we just went, oh, yeah, here he comes. Here he comes. I think <coughs> it was. <laughs> Pardon me, worst worst time to choke on myself. It was really fun to see an instance where a climber has a direct antagonist, which we got to see twice, very shortly with Futaba in, in finals. Uh, but then with Colin, I mean, Futaba's moment was, again, just like very brief when she got that disappointing moment of just like, oh, no, you weren't actually in time. Uh, but with Colin... Climb, we don't have a lot of these face-to-face -face moments where you are, you know, where there is direct conflict. And obviously this wasn't with another climber. It was with uh, uh, with the judges. But it made for some of the most compelling emotions and, and, and you know, engaging uh, 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 moments in the entire comp. It was unreal. So, of course, I think it makes complete sense that, that, that that's a profile booster. Um, I think the, I mean, the crowd was in a rowdy mood, man. They, we got the double boo, the one for Futaba and one for Colin. It was pretty unreal. Like those were engaging moments, as you can tell, just from the sound coming off the audience. Um, it was sick. It was amazing. Um, he knows better than to start a bowler like that, frankly. Um, but I mean, you know, you end up at the top eventually. So, so there it is. I'll, uh, I Sadly, kinda... with, with a bowler with an insecure start, sometimes that's what climbers are forced to do. And even on his first resend attempt mm -hmm. when he got that next hold he looked back at the judges was that okay and then went to the top and then they told him it wasn't mm -hmm. um so my big concern there and sorry i know we're talking about positives and i'm talking mm -hmm. about concerns was there was inconsistency of the judging because if you mm -hmm. watch yoshiyuki's attempt his left hand is never stable on the hold yoshiyuki literally paddles it with his left hand and gets gets away with it colin does similar, has to reclimb, does the move, looks at the judge, okay, reclimbs, no, do it again. And the thing is, the world loves someone that they think is being crapped on a little bit. If someone's fighting back, if someone's challenging the man, they're going to be local hero. And that was Colin because he was the wrong side of some marginal calls. And if anything, it, was, it sounds bad, but if you're not going to win the comp, at least be the biggest story in the comp. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and it was particularly. I'll close. We'll close with this. I I just think it was particularly interesting to see that emotion from Colin too, because Colin is he the the perception of him is he's such a cerebral guy. He's 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 reserved. You seemingly in terms of his public, you know, the public what the public sees. He's very quiet, pretty shy. Um, and and so of all the competitors to have this moment of visible frustration, irritation anger and then to be able to to channel it all into into eventually topping the the boulder for a third time it was great it was just great theater it was great that it came from colin who is not that generally that outwardly emotional and stuff usually at these at these competitions so it was just i loved it it was awesome it's funny because i never thought of it as a cerebral thing to me it was always like he was just like he was a boy caught in the headlights right like and well, that it, too part of it might just be the you know, what I think of him as was as a young climber, right? But he still looks like kind of boyish, I guess. Um, but that was always how I interpreted it. it was just like the super strong kid who's just like blinded by the lights and doesn't know how to express himself in that moment. And this was like there there was a certain amount of uh, uh, it, it was an aggressive and forthright and like kind of like manly uh, kind of way to uh, to to emote. And, and yeah, that was uh, kind of a, a changing my mentality when I when I have to think about him. So, yeah, for sure. See, it's interesting because I know John, uh, sorry, I know Colin from shooting him in youth mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I've actually seen these emotions in his climbing. So when you say it's a surprise, I'm like, well, that's how he acts. 
But of course, sure. that's not how he's been seen on camera. Yes. Well, well, I've heard. I, I mean, I've heard stories and stuff about it. Um, that that he he, it, you know, it shows emotion. That sounds weird to say. But like, <laughs> well, he, I, run, I certainly... he runs hot. Yeah, I've heard. I've I've heard about that. I've never seen it in person myself necessarily, and I've just kind of at, watching him as a spectator. We had certainly never seen anything like that, um, and so it was. Yeah, it just added to it. It was great. It's great. If you want to completely reverse all the all the things we just said about Colin and make him go back to looking boyish, just look at the most recent post on Bjorn Pohl's Instagram uh, reel. That <laughs> sends him right back to looking like a kid. What a brutal headshot. I'm going to laugh about that forever. You can find it yourselves. Uh, but anyway, my my big winner for this event, and I, I you know, it, it happened once last season and we get to talk about it again. Uh, an awesome performance from a Canadian, Madison Fisher, not just Canadian, but also from Ontario, from actually my neck of the woods. Um, extremely exciting. And coming out of qualifiers, guess what? She was, in in my opinion, she was in that club like Ayala, where we say, great performance in qualifiers. Is there any reason for us to believe that this is going to hold up? Not yet. No. So, you know, get ready for a rough semifinals. Um, and... And then it did hold up. She finished, uh, you know, joint ninth uh, out of qualifiers and then held that ninth uh, with uh, with two tops and three zones, just, you know, barely outside of the, the finals threshold, which I think was two tops, four zones and uh, and a couple uh, few a uh, few less attempts. Um, awesome climbing from Madison. And, and I'm not ready to say I expect a performance that good at every event, but I mean, that is a, a mental barrier broken right there saying, I am good enough. I am right up there with Brooke and with Chayun and all these people. And Solsa was miles below me. And I'm really freaking good at this now. And I'm extremely excited for Madison. She's a powerful climber, which is like the, the, the you know, the uh, the cliche that always gets thrown around with uh, with uh, female climbers that you know actually train strength and and power and all that, but she's grown so much. Uh, her mentality is incredible. You won't find her on social media. She abandoned that a few years ago. Um, uh, you can hear more about why in a recent interview I did with her uh, at Plastic Weekly. Um, but uh, uh, if you want to follow her, she's got a an extremely thoughtful blog on her website madisonfisher.com. Uh, if she is an athlete that that um, uh, that sparks any curiosity, you should read it. She's uh, she is genuinely thoughtful person, and she's great at expressing that stuff. Uh, so while you can't follow her on Instagram, check out her website. Um, but I think it's just a great start for Canada because I mean, for the last couple seasons, we've been sending no athletes or only just the Olympians, basically. Um, and finally, the door is open again, and we can see our athletes go and learn and get these experiences. And to have some success right off the bat is so fulfilling after so long. So uh, that was a huge win for all of us. So thank you, Madison, for climbing your heart out. I can't remember. Was it problem three that in semis that she was just spectacular on? One of them, she was just so tired and not. It was like I, yes, problem number three. Yeah, yeah. She topped like, the first which, two, and then problem three, yeah. just getting a, a. I don't even know what we're gonna call that move, but it was a over your head Gaston, and then push your body past yeah. a reasonable axis on your shoulder. Um, yeah, yeah, great. I love all the all the photographers. Fortunately, seem to get photos of that moment. And uh, as much as yeah. you don't see much of her face, it's definitely going to be a signature photo of her for for quite a while until the podium photos come. Obviously, just around the corner. But uh, yeah, yeah, really cool performance. Yeah, talk about talk about not needing to win to to get exposure. Just be the one that people talk about. Right, one of those moments for sure. So yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to uh, the biggest losers from the event. Um, and uh, Eddie, bring it back to earth for us. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm just brought in here to whinge about things. I really do. That's what we're <laughs> all here for, man. The, so the... for me, it was the, um, it was the setting. Um, the fact that someone should have to rescue someone else off a boulder and qualifying. <laughs> um and then this absurdity that they said, oh, they rewarded him with a bonus go. I could not figure okay, that so shit out at all. Let's clarify this. It became a technical the second he had to assist another climber. Mm -hmm. What do you get for a technical? Oh, God. Two uh, minutes climbing. If you're, you get your remaining climbing time, if it's more than two minutes, right? I, I don't anyway. Yeah, remaining climbing yeah. time of more than two minutes or yeah. two minutes if it's under two minutes. Yeah. 
And so when they say they rewarded them an extra attempt, it should be well like, no, they they shouldn't. <laughs> that that's not a reward. That's just you know the reward should have been here's a special medal so that one of your colleagues didn't yeah. totally destroy his hand, and we really appreciate your foresight and your awareness that you went to help a fellow athlete because that was a great narrative for the comp um led to by piss poor setting but a great narrative for the comp but across the board i thought the setting was divisive um one of the things i hate and it seems to be more prevalent in female boulders than in men's is when you have a really big round start block that they've got to get like all points on and you end up with like photo after photo because obviously I'm on social media oh, photo after photo of like everyone like doing this little potty squat on a volume mm. and, and that's not appealing climbing and we saw that time and time again and then the awkward starts and finals that pull your attention away because you're watching someone not work it out for three minutes out of four and they're yes. not working out the crux on the route they're not getting off the mat and to me that's poor setting because you're not bringing them into the boulder. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're actually a spectator at an event like this, it can be really frustrating when you get that because if you're watching in the crowd and the climber's never actually getting off the ground, you actually, if you're not the tallest person, you're not even going to see them falling sure. off the start. Um, and it's hard on the commentators because then the commentators have to fluff and full time because, you know, no, someone's going, doink, 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 doink. So, yeah, that and just the, the high shoulder risk moves. You talked about Yanya being dropped earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm actually happy she's climbing outdoors because the, <laughs> the odds of her shoulders surviving are way higher than the odds of her shoulders surviving if all the comps are set like this one was. There was way too many rotational press shoulder moves. So I was like, eh. Mm. That, that's my... Yeah, biggest loser. What would you so yeah. like? You you brought up a few different themes there. So one being uh, uh, the danger of that particular crack, uh, but then uh, shoulder moves, and then the one that I can that I a hundred percent agree with. Um, although I'm not sure it's sorry. The one I think I agree with the most is convoluted starts, um, which yeah. I I don't enjoy any time a start position you know, ends up having to, to take a, a ton of extra attention from the judges. I think that's, you know, whether or not, you, I guess what I'm trying to say is obviously if somebody sends it, then it makes it a whole lot easier to understand. And, and the root setters can't always predict if somebody's going to work or not. But to me, these, the cruxes where it's establishing the start rather than the move off the start is not worth it. I don't enjoy that. Um, and I, I completely agree with you. But what do you think was the is the the area that is is like most uh, most egregious, or the one that we should really be focusing on? Uh, if we were to go to egregious, then we always have to look at our athlete welfare first. Mm -hmm. We're an athlete based sport, and this is what you know. This is what people seem to struggle with, and people think that the sport is events. The sport isn't events. The sport is athletes. Without athletes, it doesn't matter if you've got the biggest, shiniest climbing wall ever. It's not going to work. So you need to protect those stars. And I get concerned when I see really big, like for the guys, there was like the guest on jump and press. For the girls, top of number three, a couple of the problems in semis as well. And, you know, you saw Mejdi walk off after one of the boulders and he's like, Yes. massaging his shoulder you saw in semis a couple of athletes working their shoulders and this is comp number one how are their shoulders going to be by comp number six or seven it, there were some scary falls too um in in all rounds there were some really i mean that's what you're going to get when when you have swinging dinos right like you're going to get some yeah. some really sketchy falls and and it just seemed like um luckily no one was injured but it did it seemed like there were a lot, a lot more sketchy falls than than it normal I, I, I just by observation but it seemed to be quite a lot of high risk and high risk i mean movement risk but also injury risk moves quite high so climbers were catapulting like one time and andrea just l launched off one of the problems mm -hmm. um also you had the 
questionable dino in I think it was Woman's Four that they said, well, it's not a downwards dino, it's a sideways dino. But the problem is the way the girls were doing it, once they swing, Mm -hmm. they're above the foothold, so it becomes a downwards dino. Yeah. So the root setter's excuse was it's not a downwards dino because there's a foothold down there, and if we're on that, then that foothold's no lower. But if they've got to swing to get it, and they're swinging above that level, then the trajectory is down. And you saw that in some of the falls, that if they missed, which the majority, I think, with the exception of Natalia and Yanya, they missed. They were taking hard falls and high-risk falls. So, I, you know, I don't even know if I can pin a single thing, and I don't know whether they were trying to be too made-for-TV and showy, because, of course, the guy's final was, what, boing, 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 like jump, jump, jump. Um, and, yeah, you know, I've said for years, I'll stick with it, that there needs to be a study done into injury prevention and climbers and what setters can do to minimize risk and i think this comp was high risk hmm. fair point john you're uh you're a big loser from the weekend yeah i feel really bad for miho nanaka uh, and normally i would not put a competitor on the the loser category or whatever you want to call it just from having one bad competition i i don't think that that's I just would, I just don't like doing that. But since she posted on her social media about it, and she was very open about being frustrated and a little uh, just disappointed with herself, I think since she's been honest and forthcoming, I think I I, I feel a little bit better discussing it openly. Um, I can't help but wonder if this is another case of Olympic fatigue which we kind of mentioned at the top of this debrief um i also wonder you know maybe there's some pressure on her uh, with akio retiring i th- i think there's this void of um uh, like who is going to be that that leader on the the J- japanese team who's going to be kind of the the captain either officially or de facto informal captain and i think a lot of people are naturally looking to to miho to fill that role um, because she's so decorated on the circuit, because she's got experience, because she's an Olympian, and because she's just one of the best in the world, uh, it, it might have been a lot of pressure. I, we, you know, we don't want. We can only speculate. Um, I hope she comes back stronger because certainly it was. It, it does not feel like the norm to see her in twenty seventh place, not even making semis. Um, and uh, so I was just really surprised, and it sounds like she was surprised too. So, well, yeah, I mean, for Miho, it's the first semi she's ever missed. Yeah, and she's been doing World Cups since 2014, so that was a big shock. And I, I'm sure she does feel the pressure because Yanya definitely feels the pressure as the Olympic gold medalist, and Miho is the Olympic silver medalist. So I'm sure there is pressure on her. Um, I wonder if part of the reason she was in the States for a while. Um, was to separate herself from that pressure and actually let let her try and clear her head before, before the season. You know, hang out with people she likes hanging out with, be in a different environment, de-stress. Um, and I'll be curious, because if she has another comp where she struggles, I could understand her stepping away from the season like Yanya has, because I think we might actually lose quite a few Olympians over the year when they decide that it's actually better to ditch this year, fully recover, and then come back for the qualification trail next year. Yeah, I, I my all I was going to say was I I don't uh, for all of the Olympic athletes I, I I I have relatively low expectations in terms of consistency and how they're going to feel about comps for the next little while. I think it was just such a, a huge ordeal, positive and negative at the same time. Um, I don't think they've had enough time to decompress. If you decided you were going to be doing these World Cups, you would have started training a while ago. So it makes sense to me that, you know, some of them might dip their toes in again, see how they feel, and they might not like it. Some of them, you know, Yanya hit her stride again, but she's, you know, probably making a good choice of taking a break as much as that hurts to say. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope she doesn't weigh this performance too much. Um, because we know what she is like as an actual climber when she's in top form and when she's in great mental shape as well. So, um, uh, I hope, yeah, I hope it doesn't get to her head. And with that, uh, my, my biggest loser, um, is, uh, is the Russian climbing team. Um, 
Uh, I'm sure people have lots of different feelings about this, and that's perfectly okay. And I don't want my uh, my position to be taken for what it's not. Uh, the Russian climbing team hasn't had their homes and neighborhoods and families and climbing walls bombed and burned and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm obviously coming at this with the full understanding of that. Um, but I am I, I am disappointed that all these athletes who um, some of whom took the took, in my opinion, a, a bit of a risk to show a certain amount of solidarity on social media, which in in Russia and this particular state is probably not always the safest thing to do. Um, these people who have expressed the connection with their families and friends from Ukraine and different parts of the world. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it, it is particularly stark because this feels like the first season where the doors are open again to everybody after COVID. Um, it feels like the family, like the whole gang is here, the gang's back together. And we've kind of shut the door um, on uh, a bunch of climbers from a part of the world that has always historically been a huge part of climbing and it, particularly competition climbing, an extremely helpful and productive federation. Um, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, say that the flag shouldn't fly and the federation shouldn't be hosting events and this and that. Uh, but it, it feels to me a little too far to not see the athletes competing um, so to, you know, to the Alexis and Yulia's and Ekaterina's and Victoria's and all those people, I think, I think everybody misses them and I disagree with this decision. So in, in my opinion, I wish they were at these events competing under no flag at all. Uh, and, uh, I'm sure they know it, but, um, uh, uh we miss them and I hope we have the chance to welcome them back without prejudice as soon as possible. It does feel weird. You know, I didn't live through any part of the Cold War, basically. It feels weird for a sort of new Iron Curtain to be dropped. But this time it's not, you know, Russian climbers being restricted from coming to Europe. It's Europe and the rest of the world not letting them come to us. And that just kind of tweaks me the wrong way. So I miss them a lot and hopefully we'll get to see them soon. Uh, I want to add something on this one. Sure. Uh, I almost put in my biggest winners column was the Ukrainians that were able to attend because that was incredibly brave for them to do under the circumstances with interrupted training, all the fear, all the angst. Um, you know, we kind of like, oh, well, they're in Europe now, so they're okay, but they're still receiving horrible news on a daily basis. It's still incredibly traumatic for them. Um, so, as I said, they were kind of an honourable mention of my biggest winner. Uh, my heart goes out to them so much. So much I've heard is horribly grim um and the simple answer is we can't have the russians in within the structure of world cups as they exist today because unlike a lot of individual sports we always compete for teams so if you go to a tennis competition rafa nadal is wearing what rafa nadal wears um djokovic is wearing some anti-vax shirt federer is wearing whatever he wants to wear but in climbing you wear national colors and if you say well you're not climbing for your country it's the same as the roc in the olympics you knew that they were russians because they were the ones sure. wearing so i actually think that if we were a more mature sport that wasn't relying on national federations if we existed on a seeding system like tennis then we probably would be able to have the russians in competing as individual athletes but under the team structure it's an untenable position and it probably will be an untenable position for a long time. I think, you know, we, we've got to do our belts up that we might not see them this side of the Olympics. Yeah. And I, I guess my argument is I, I believe that is unacceptable. Um, and I, I, I probably feel that way about most sports, frankly, that I, 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 uh, it feels unreasonable, uh, to, to be, to be punishing people that have no connection and no bearing on on the political operations of of a of a country, um, and uh, I I don't think it's reasonable for sports that claim to be apolitical, um, and, and <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to suggest that death and war and all that stuff is is you know just a, a frivolous thing that we should be ignoring. Um, but, uh, I, I think that there should be mechanisms for inclusion at times like this. Cause I, I think that's the, the actual value of sport with this is to be inclusive, um, and to keep those connections strong rather than alienating people from different parts of the world. 
Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I, I absolutely take your point. I, I think there is probably not a model for it. I, I acknowledge that, but uh, I wish there was. Um, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, the, the, and the only thing I'll add is that the, um, you know, let's not forget that the first World Cup of this season was supposed to take place in, in Russia and um, two, week, two weeks ago and how quickly the world changes, you know, has changed. Um, yep. It's pretty incredible. Yep. So. Yeah, it's it's been rough just seeing, you know, the Instagram stories and seeing the different perspectives from different groups. And, you know, as much as I want to be incredibly supportive of the Russians, and I've got so many friends within the Russian com climbing community, I've definitely seen things in social media that, go, that make me go, I would be uncomfortable with them attending a World Cup at the moment. Hmm. And I also think it would be incredibly unfair on the Ukrainians who are going through so much. You look at someone like Sergei Topishko who posts a photo of his family home destroyed and just his climbing wall in the backyard. Mm -hmm. How is he going to feel inside if the people invading him are training one block over and laughing and having a good time? Even though he knows them at a personal level, it's still going to really be... I think that's going to take a lot of healing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably reasonable. I guess the, the angle I would take is... is, is uh, I think uh, this is going to sound naff as hell, but I, I, I guess what I was going to say is like the, the healing starts with just you know being around each other and, and in my opinion, experiencing each other as people. Um, and I think, I think it's reasonable to expect a higher level of decorum from everybody in this situation because i have also seen a couple posts not from active athletes but some russian uh, athletes seeing stuff that is not so great um in my opinion but um but yeah so anyway i'll uh, I, everybody can have their own opinion on this but that was the one thing i think at the very least we can all wish you know the best to those athletes who are shut out of the sport that they care about um presumably to no, uh, no fault of their own. Um, but yeah, I'll leave that to everybody else to have their own opinion on, but yeah. Um, I kind of forget how to close out these shows. Um, so in, in lieu of that, does anybody have any final words, 60 seconds or less while I get my thoughts together? <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of honorable men mentions real quickly. Yeah. Blood, block. blood, blood. blood. Uh, <laughs> there, there was a lot of blood going on. Like, <laughs> I don't know where they had some extra sharp holds, but blood, blood, blood. That that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> what, was it was it was it Orion that her her leg was cut and she taped it up really fast? And I remember as she was taping it, I I, I was watching her and I was saying, "Oh, wow, you're doing that really really tight." <laughs> and then it yeah. seems like she got one attempt, and and yeah, sure enough, it, it was too tight and she had to loosen it and stuff. I could tell that she was um she was she was putting that tape on with uh with a frenzy and adrenaline and i knew right away it yeah. was going to be too tight so that was fun yeah no it was um it was i don't know what the deal was because they were all leg cuts but there was some really you know stasia colin uh Ariane, and quite a few from semis as well really and apparently i don't know if you saw niels fav um his post on instagram because he was one of the last climbers out and he went to that crack in qualifying and he said it was just full of blood, absolutely <laughs> full of blood. And he asked for them to clean it and they sent him behind the wall for 40 minutes. It was his last problem and he had to wait for 40 minutes backstage. And he said he came out and it was still full of blood. There was so much blood in it they couldn't even clean it properly. Jesus. Wow. One, uh, one final question for both of you. What did you think of the format of having the men's, the the let's see the women's semis and finals on one day and then the following day the was it the men's came men's. in yeah, yeah men's and the men's semis and finals on the on the next day what do you guys think of that uh i think from a show perspective it's really good from an athlete perspective it's probably pretty good because they get longer to heal their skin uh, maybe what would be better would be qualifiers one day both semis the next day finals the last day because, um, for instance, women had no extra day to heal their skin. Mm -hmm. The men did. And sure, they can alter they could alternate it comp by comp. In general, I loved it, though, because it actually allowed semis to shine as a round. Yes. And semis quite often suffers because you would end up with so many people on the mats that you're constantly missing stuff. And only having four people on the mats, much yeah. better. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was torn because obviously in 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 my part of the and, and I mean Eddie had it even harder, but the the element of trying to watch it live was very difficult. When like I I went to sleep seven different times from Friday night to Sunday, uh, which is not sustainable. Not that not that I'm forced to. I just want to. I guess maybe I'll give that up after the after a couple events. Now, I should say that I looking at the info sheets for the upcoming events, they're not continuing with this as far as I could tell. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm with Eddie. I, I guess in my head, I kind of always liked having semifinals with everybody together because I don't prioritize it as much. And I personally think that semifinals should be broadcast in a different way in a perfect world. I don't expect that to ever happen, but I think semifinals should be fairly replay reliant. I think it should be a different with, you know, eight climbers. And so, for so long, I think it should focus mostly on good conversation from a bunch of broadcast or commentators and athletes focus on the replays. Don't, you know, it's uh, it's a little too long around to broadcast as an all live kind of thing for me, in my opinion. Um, but I, I think Eddie's point stands great. And I think the suggestion of semifinals on one day, finals on the other would make more sense, probably, unless there's something I'm not thinking of. But yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I, yeah. I loved it just because I, you know, there's always the letdown after a, a great comp after, finals. you know, it's like you you wake up the next morning, the morning after finals, and you're like, oh, man, it's over. Like, I wish there was – that was so cool. I wish there was another one. And here there was. It's like there was a great finals, <laughs> and you wake up the next morning, you're like, oh, I wish we could do that again. And you're like, oh, it's it, it, we can. It is. It's today. It was. I thought that was really fun. It, it kind of extended the hype uh, and the excitement for another day, which was cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll wrap it there. Uh, first of all, I want to say a thanks to Zulazfar in the Discord. Uh, you know what you did. Thank you very much. Uh, if you love this kind of discussion, uh, make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. You can support it at the Patreon in the link. And if you like talking about competition climbing or gym culture in general, or if you'd like to watch along with us in the chat, make sure you join the Plastic Weekly Discord also at the link below. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Eddie, for coming back. Uh, we're going to make it a tradition if, uh, if you're around a webcam after the first World Cup of each year. And of course, as always, thank you to uh, John Bergman for being here as well. And with that, We'll see all of you in the next one.